Good morning or good afternoon, those of you who are watching. Welcome back to another virtual edition of our Art and Focus program series. Uh, today's very special guest is actually with me in the office uh, behind me. You might be able to make out that figure, which is matching the image that you're seeing on screen right now. That is our sculpture by an unknown Chinese artist. It's a Sichuan Qin player. This object dates from the Han Dynasty, so that could be anywhere from 206 BCE to 220 CE, so kind of a, a broad range, about 400 years. It's earthenware. I would say that it looks probably a little bit more brownish in the light of this office, but the color that you're seeing in the photograph on screen is actually more true to what my eyes are seeing as I turn around and look at the sculpture. It's got more of a, a reddish color, think like a terracotta. Uh, it's 25 inches tall, which, you know, I don't have a banana for scale and it's a little bit behind me, but it's it's reasonably large size. As we were reminded when we removed it from its display case in the back hall of the Bellarmine Hall Galleries a couple of days ago in preparation for this uh, special event, put it on a cart very carefully, moved it into here into the director's office. If you have been to the Fairfield University Art Museum's uh, Bellarmine Hall Galleries, you might know that it's a, a very cozy and intimate space which as you also know is real estate speak for saying it's very small. And the hallway where we have a series of cases that contain objects from Asia, from the ancient Americas, uh, some objects of ancient Greek and Roman art on loan from Yale. It's a fairly narrow hallway. So it would be difficult even, um, well, it's not a problem for a virtual art and focus, but for the in-person events, uh, it's a little bit less than ideal. So we decided to take the object out of the case and, and bring her out into the world because this is a female figure. So I'm using a female pronoun for her. And I want to mention that this sculpture is one of several that was donated to the University Art Museum by Leo Swergold in 2011 in honor of his wife, Jane, who taught at Fairfield in the interior design program for many years. So perhaps some of you who are watching our alumni uh, remember Jane Swergold. And that is why how this artwork entered our collection as a generous gift from those uh, collectors of Chinese antiquities. And I'm going to put into the chat, as always, you're welcome to put your observations and questions into the chat box on the quick live. Uh, but I'm going to ask our producer to insert a link that will take you to a lovely PDF of a brochure for an exhibition that took place here at the museum Back in 2012, uh, the museum was not called the Fairfield University Art Museum then. It was known as the Bellarmine Museum of Art. But it was an exhibition of Chinese antiquities from the Square Gold Collection. It included this Sichuan Chin player, which they later generously gifted to us, along with three other works from the Han and Tang dynasties. So you can download and read the full catalog at that, um, it's called the Digital Commons Repository, if you are so interested. Of course, here we are more than 10 years in the future. The Chin Player is a, a valued resident of the Bellarmine Hall Galleries, but it is such a pleasure always with art history, I think, to come face to face, as it were, with uh, an art object. And although I've been seeing this object in the case for the years that I've worked here at the museum, I had never actually seen it out uh, in the main galleries. I was not working here at Fairfield when this show that I just mentioned that we're dropping the catalog link in the chat too. I wasn't here then, so I did not see it before it was in its now current home. And one thing that struck me, in fact, was that it was quite large. It was larger than it appeared to me in the case in which it lives. Just no, went too far. I thought I had a picture of it in its case, but I guess I didn't insert it. Uh, so it struck me as very large. And since I and the museum registrar was the one that were very carefully maneuvering it out of the case, I all of it also have a sense of its its physical heft. And a surprising feature, which should not have been a surprise since it was mentioned in the catalog, and that is that the chin player's head is a separately uh, molded piece from the rest of the body. So the registrar had pointed out as we are moving it to be very careful to support the head because it is not of a piece with the sculpture. And this, in fact, is very common for sculptures of this type from this period. The heads and the bodies might be interchangeable um, in a certain respect. So the title of this lovely artwork, The Sichuan Chin Player, is telling you a, a couple of things. One, it's telling you what part of China this object originally came from. So we know a time frame, Han Dynasty, but the Sichuan uh, region of the province is in the southern part of China. And those who are specialist in Chinese uh, dress and customs of the past, for example, would point to something like the headdress that we see at the top, 
which is more typical of the Sichuan region. And this, in fact, kind of object uh, stylistically is associated with other ones of this type that come from that part of China. And it's called the chin player because this woman is playing a chin. So Q-I-N, but pronounced with a ch sound. Uh, we're going to play you in a second a very short two-minute video that is a, it's on YouTube. Uh, it's from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in about 2016, they recorded a Chinese musician performing with an example of this instrument. Uh, the example that you're about to see is from the Ming Dynasty period, so more than a thousand years in the future from ours, but it will give you a sense of the kind of beautiful sound that this chin instrument could play. So our producer is gonna play that video now. So I hope you enjoyed listening to that. Um, just because of the, um, the strange realities of doing this through the Zoom interface, as you were watching that video, I could see in the little box from shared with the producer what you were seeing, but the sound didn't pass through to me. Now, I've heard that video a number of times. I also really love Chinese TV shows, full disclosure. So I'm very familiar with the sound of the chin being plucked like that. But it was interesting just to watch it for two minutes as only a silent performance of her hands moving over the instrument. And it's still so incredibly lovely. But you're seeing on screen that image of the, the chin player's uh, fingers. And I hope you were able to see some similarities in the, the very clear gesture of plucking that she's making. So this is not um, something, an instrument that had frets. It's not meant to be strummed like a guitar, but very much that delicate plucking sound with seven strings, which are not, of course, in evidence on this particular instrument. So in case anyone missed it, that video that you just watched, you can look it up on YouTube. It was a performance at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2016 using a historical instrument from their collection. Their instrument dating from the Ming Dynasty, I think around the year 1500. The one that is depicted in the object behind us though, much, much older. So this is very much an ancient Chinese instrument that is uh, being viewed here. And I'm gonna go back to our Full image, oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. There's our chin player again. So the Han Dynasty period, for those of you who are less familiar with the long and storied uh, history of China as a nation, as an empire, uh, if you think of the terracotta warriors, the first emperor of China, those warriors that were buried with him, that also comes from the beginning of the Han Dynasty. So this is the period that is often associated with a great period of stability and some consolidation into not quite the borders of what would be modern China, but a major step toward uh, China becoming 
uh, the nation state it would emerge as in later times, and a period of stability after a long period of some instability. What's also interesting, it is during the Han Dynasty that objects like this one, like our Sichuan chin player, or the type of object that it is, became very, very popular and very common. As art historians, one of the questions we are always asking is not just, you know, how do we describe the materiality of the thing we're looking at, but we also want to know what it's for. And prior to the modern art period, as I'm sure many of you know, most objects were made with some kind of function in mind. Are they dedicated to the propaganda of a ruler? Are they for some sort of religious devotion? And our chin player falls into a category of objects. The Chinese term is mingqi, M-I-N-G-Q-I. Uh, but generally in English, we would refer to them as grave goods or funerary goods. And I would invite you to consider if you have participated in a wake or funeral for a loved one, if you've ever seen someone tuck something into a casket that has a particular connection to the deceased, maybe a rosary beads or a particular book or some sort of belonging that is sent with them uh, to their final resting place. Now, I don't think that most of us, I don't want to speak for everyone's religious beliefs, but I, I don't think that most people are generally thinking of their departed loved one actually using that physical object in the afterlife. But Mingqi, grave goods of the Han dynasty period and later, it was understood in ancient China, as in many other cultures around the world, we're probably most familiar with the ancient Egyptians doing this practice. The idea that your tomb needed to contain all of the things that you would need in the next life. And the those left behind filling the tomb with physical and painted depictions of things that would entertain uh, the deceased spirit in the next life, would keep them company. Uh, playing music, as we can imagine, would be a wonderful thing to imagine, especially that wonderfully calming chin music that we just heard a few moments ago. Uh, there would be games, there would be uh, depictions of livestock and other sort of agricultural activity, all sorts of the accoutrements of the scholarly life. So China, very early on, had established some of the great achievements of a nobleman or a scholar involved being able to play the chin, being able to play the game of chess, being able to paint, especially landscape painting, and being able to do calligraphy. So the tools that you would need to engage in all of those scholarly pursuits would be something that a noble tomb would be expected to have. So it is hard for us to look at an object like this, even though it's intrinsically interesting, I think, in its own right, and even cooler for me because I've gotten to you know, handle it directly. We have to imagine it as originally having been designed to exist in relationship with a whole slew of other objects, some of which would have been very directly related to this one. So for example, uh, it's understood that this tomb, and we don't know what tomb this object came out of, there would have probably been a group of musicians playing different instruments and they would have been able to sort of subtly relate to each other by their gestures. Maybe one like this one is in the moment of plucking a string and another one might have been depicted at rest. We can't know because we don't have the other objects from this tomb, but we imagine this existing in a tomb space, again, lots of other objects and on the walls, painted depictions of sort of happy revels in the afterlife. So Chinese beliefs about the afterlife in this period involved sort of a splitting of two sides of the human spirit, one that moved up to the heavens and one that might stay around in the terrestrial, terrestrial sphere. And Confucius had advised and talked about the need to provide offerings to make sure that the souls of the ancestors are as comfortable as possible. But what's interesting is that they specifically talked about you don't need to make something that's the same size or material or exact function as an object that a living person would, would use. So the idea being that this is by no means a life-size sculpture of a musician. Um, the depictions of livestock and pottery didn't need to be the size of a goat or a chicken or a cow. It was okay for them to be sized down, to be not as functional. So you might have an incense burner that has the shape of one that might be cast in bronze for a Chinese merchant to use but the one found in a tomb would not have the holes in the lid to actually let incense escape. So there's this very clear sense in Chinese literature, a sense of needing to provide for the comfort and care of the dead, but also a sense of what they need is different from what the living will use. So they were not uh, exactly equivalent objects. There's our a close up on our 
uh, uh, chin again on screen. And I also think this close up A lets you see that sort of warm color of the terracotta earthenware of this sculpture. And also the sort of um, irregular and pitted surface. And there's some indication that this object, like many others of the Ming Chi variety, might originally have had a very subtle um, layer of paint. And I don't really mean paint as in pigment, but rather um, colored slip. Slip being a little bit of clay mixed with water, just to add a sort of visual additional element to it. But certainly the surface of this object coming to us from perhaps more than 2,000 years of history is not as smooth as it might once have been. Uh, many of these Ming Chi objects, they were created in potter studios. There was a huge demand for them. As I mentioned before, the Hang Dynasty was when uh, Ming Chi production really soared. So there was an element of both uh, mass production, the use of elements like molds to cast many of these uh, Ming Chi objects. And that might play into what I mentioned before about the head being removable. Let's see, I think I have the detail of the head. You might be able to see there a very clear lip around the neck of this figure and then the narrowness of the uh, the rest of the neck inside it. And that just lifts clear. And clearly those two were modeled, were fired as two wholly different pieces. But that also implies a certain ability to sort of mix and match. And what it made me think of when I read about that was uh, if you've heard of the, the terracotta army of the first Chinese emperor, that while the members of that army all seem quite individual, they have different hairstyles, they have different feature types, they have different, slightly different expressions, different uniforms, scholars have actually determined there is a, a preset number of variations, because in that case, they developed a certain repertoire of types of ears, types of facial, um, facial elements, types of hairstyles, different types of clothing, and then mixed and matched them to make this incredible array of seemingly individual terracotta warriors. It's incredible in terms of the craftsmanship. It's incredible in terms of the amount of design thinking where they are thinking about the need to vary. You're not going to have the exact same chin player in every individual's tomb. Uh, you can also see a little bit more close up there of the headdress, these sort of round forms. Uh, are intended to be read as flowers, which is pretty interesting, or floral adornments on the hair. Uh, I don't think I necessarily would have been able to read the sculpture coming as someone who does not have a background in Chinese art. Would I have read this immediately as a female uh, player? Not necessarily, but I relied on information, for example, in the catalog that was written in 2012 for that show, where they mentioned that that is a headdress would have been worn by a female musician as opposed to a, um, a male player. I also like with great economy of line, this sculptor has given you a sense of the overlapping a hanfu that they're wearing, these simple robes going back one. And you can see that even though this might have been potentially partially made in a, a molded process, there's this great care being taken to give a, a volumetric sense of the sleeves. You know, that's not necessary for there to be these folds indicating where the different layers of the sleeves are moving over each other. We have a sense of the belt around the midsection of this figure. A lot of care has been taken, even in a relatively humble uh, pottery representation, to give the sense of naturalism. Another thing that marks this sculpture out is coming from the Sichuan region of China. It's not just the headdress, which is stylistically related to others from that region. It's also the little smile that this person has which if we're thinking about this being intended as grave goods, how wonderful to imagine that this is, a museum, this is a musician who's not only playing for the departed ancestor in the afterlife, but having a good time doing it. And this sort of gentle smile is characteristic of objects from this time and from this place. And in fact, in preparing for uh, today's program, I just went poke here on online. I wanted to see examples of Ming Chi and other collections and I just threw it into Google. And what popped up was not something from a museum collection, but the image on the left turned up in an auction website uh, from an auction house in Europe. I can't think of the name of it now offhand. And they'd included some basic information about it. They also indicated it was a Sichuan chin player, male, not female. Notice the difference in headdress. And I was interested to note that they're about the same dimensions. So about the same 25 inches in height. Uh, what is also interesting to me is the image, the object on the left, I can't quite tell with the shadow whether the head is of one piece with the body or whether it is two pieces or perhaps whether a 
previous owner joined them together in some way. It's difficult for me to tell, and there weren't any other images on the website. Uh, but just seeing two of them together with their happy smiles on their faces, I think does help us a little envision these as part of a full sort of panoply of grave goods that would have been sort of found together. I think that's my, I thought I had a one, one larger image of it, but I don't. Uh, as I mentioned in the chat, you can find a link to the Digital Commons Repository at Fairfield, and you can read this wonderful catalog brochure about the show that this artwork was in back in 2012. Uh, if you have questions about this object or other information you'd like to know, you can always email museum at fairfield.edu, and we will do our best to uh, answer your questions or find an expert who can answer them for you. It's sad to me to think that the object behind me is going to go back into its case where it lives typically, because it's been a pleasure to have it sort of out uh, in the museum's real world environment. But just know that you can drop by anytime and see this on our campus. It's in our Bellarmine Hall galleries. We're open Tuesday through Saturday from 11 to 4. And brand new as of last week, we are open now extended hours every Thursday until 8 p.m. And that's in both of our galleries going forward. So we hope that if you are local to the area, you'll stop by Fairfield University, you'll check out the Chin Player in person as long as with other members of our permanent collection. And we will look forward to seeing you at the next Art in Focus. Take care, everyone. <laughs>